Welcome to the DeFi Standard, and this is Mickey B. Fresh and Patty XRP. Today, we're going to talk about Ripple's liquidity hub for the enterprises. So first thing I'm going to start off here, I know this has been covered by many YouTubers, but we're going to dive into it a little deeper, and Patty and I are going to share our thoughts on what we think the liquidity hub is going to turn into. We got a little diagram that Patty made to give us a little visual of what it's going to look like. Um, it's going to incorporate XRP, LTC, BTC, and ETC. So those are the digital assets that it's going to incorporate. Now I want to touch on here before we get into the whole thing that this does have to do with their patent that was recently released in early spring. So this is a coordination between their patent and some of their ODL products that they're running now. So they've been running this for two years, and now they're incorporating it to the whole digital asset marketplace and this has to go with their whole crypto first motto that they're turning into. So if you wanna go here, Patty, to the uh, actual Ripple Insights. Yep, for sure. So to touch on a few things from this blog before we get further, um, basically during Swell, they revealed their plans for a new Ripple liquidity hub, which is gonna be a groundbreaking new way for enterprises to easily and efficiently source digital assets from the broader crypto market. Uh, it's designed as a turnkey solution for financial institutions and will leverage smart order routing to source digital assets at optimized prices from market makers, exchanges, and OTC desks. Enterprises will use the liquidity hub to easily and seamlessly provide their end customers with the ability to buy, sell, and hold digital assets. Uh, additionally, um, down here, they said, while the XRP ledger and XRP are and will remain a native part of our tech stack, we at Ripple believe that achieving interoperability is key to unlocking crypto's true potential. The ability to interoperate across crypto networks will break down barriers to entry, enable greater competition and inclusion. Because of this, the liquidity hub will initially support, like Mickey was saying, Bitcoin, Ether, Litecoin, uh, Ethereum Classic, Bitcoin Cash, and XRP, with plans to add dig additional digital assets over time. Um, and in the future, Ripple plans to add functionality such as staking and yield generating functionalities. So this is really interesting, Mickey, especially with the assets they started with. Um, one thing you may notice is they're all proof of work chains other than XRP. And with that, you know, one of the big tie ins to Ripple um, as an investor, a partner and all that good stuff. They SBI crypto has mining pool services to the masses back in the spring. They also have been doing mining for a while. And I imagine some of the other customers they have within RippleNet do um, some form of mining on proof of work chains. So to me, it makes sense. Those are the assets they're including right off the bat. I know in their video, uh, they had Polkadot as one of them showing on their dashboard. I would imagine, you know, all the big chains like that, whether it be, you know, Dot, Solana, um, Cardano in the future, you know, Spark, once that gets out, those kind of things will be included as well. Um, and we even know, didn't PolySign just recently start something with Solana as well? So I think that kind of leans into that thinking uh, too. Yeah, speaking of PolySign. So PolySign announced from Jack McDonald in recent interviews that they're going to be having a transactional blockchain that's going to memorialize transactions. I mean, that sounds very similar to what's going on here with the liquidity hub. So you have to make, it has to make you think that these two things are overlapping in some way, shape, or form. We know PolySign's blockchains, you know, there's two of them uh, that we know of, were built by Arthur Brito and David Schwartz, both co-creators of the XRP ledger. We don't know if they're actual side chains, so I don't want to speculate too much on that. But Patty has a nice diagram here, if you want to pull that up, Patty, mm -hmm. that I think really gives kind of a visual that was nice if you want to give a little run through on this. But first, I just want to just throw into the PolySign thing a little speculation here. So they created that for the wealth management. They're going to have Cowan as an investment bank who's going to act as a market maker. And then on PolySign, you have Standard Custody, which is an actual digital bank. So you have them on the blockchain being able to do custody. And then we know Ripple talks about their wallets. Their wallets are going to be, be able to hold all types of digital assets. And when I say digital assets, tokenized assets, security tokens, XRP, Litecoin. So they're going to be, have some capability to be able to hold from multiple blockchains. And I also think this involves block sets 
which is a subsidiary of BRD, which had investment from SBI and Spring when, before it was Ripple X. And they have that single plugin API that allows it to connect to multiple blockchains and they have the wallet as a service. So there's other components I think they're gonna plug into Ripple's liquidity hub besides just ODL. And I think they built it out this way so all the white label services can plug in eventually. Absolutely. And before we get into this, Mickey, um, you know, one of the issues or I guess a, a few of the issues for institutions trying to get in to the crypto space is, you know, issues with liquidity, which Ripple's directly trying to tackle here. Uh, custody is another issue with private keys. We know policy PolySign is making a multi-party custody set uh, blockchain, and they're also going to have a settlement blockchain as well. Uh, so that solves that kind of issue. And then lastly is privacy. So right now, PolySign and Ripple's products are permissioned. Ashish Birla did in an interview say that maybe one day that moves to a permissionless type of protocol, but that's something we'll have to see in the future. So, you know, they're going to have solutions for three of the main issues, uh, albeit it will be in a private permission setting. So with that, Let's start on the right over here. So this is kind of a tech stack that we're looking at. So you can imagine you have all these different layer one blockchains, you know, Bitcoin, XRP Ledger, Ethereum, Litecoin, and some of the others they mentioned. And those are all layer low, layer one. So above those is basically going to be this aggregator layer, which, you know, I would guess is probably the MPC solution from PolySign. And with that, it's going to be able to tap into and get you know manage assets in these layer ones and then above that you know there's probably a messaging layer for communication sending quotes uh whether it be to market makers centralized exchange otc desks things of that nature and you know we'd probably guess that that's where ripple net would live so that would be essentially in layer three above the aggregator so with that we can look over here and, you know, basically this aggregator is going to tap into centralized exchanges, market makers, uh, DEXs in the future, if they have enough liquidity, OTC DEX, uh, and lots of other, you know, whatever entities that they could source liquidity from. And so one of the big things here is no pre-funding. There's an issue with centralized exchanges with their infrastructure that it requires even uh, really big like investment firms, banks, financial institutions to pre-fund accounts with the centralized exchange to be able to buy and sell and trade crypto. Now, that's something they don't want to do. So what Ripple is essentially building here, uh, you know, possibly along with PolySign is that they have this aggregator that can send quotes to the centralized exchange and they can basically source the liquidity back to Ripple and that facilitates to whoever is engaging in a particular trade or action. So, you know, it solves a lot of problems. You know, things like this in the future, you could theoretically swap from Bitcoin to Ethereum without incurring like any kind of gas fees or anything of that nature, as opposed to going from Bitcoin to Ethereum directly on layer one, that could be rather difficult at this point in time. Uh, so those are some of the big things on how we kind of think this could possibly work. And Mickey, I'd love to hear if you have more to add on to that. Yeah, so this is like one big liquidity network. So instead of Ripple having to build like their own exchange, for example, right? they're able to tap into a multitude of global exchanges all over the world. And this is why we haven't heard Ripple partnering with an exchange in every single corridor. And ever since 2018, 2017, 2018, when I got into really deep into researching Ripple, you know, at first I thought, oh, they would just partner with an exchange in every single corridor. And we noticed that they have not done that. And the reason has been because they're creating one big distributed exchange. That's what this is. It's a distributed exchange. There's multiple exchanges connected to each other. And what really is an exchange? An exchange is just a wallet, and then it has its own trading engine offline, off chain. But technically, it just is a wallet. So it's a bunch of XRP wallets connected to each other, or a bunch of Bitcoin wallets connected to each other. And they're tying that all in together to tie the liquidity. So think of it like a distributed exchange liquidity network, right? And then there'll be one front end interface that will be able to be accessed by the RippleNet customers or anyone who's a customer of this liquidity hub. Now, I think there'll be different types of entities. So you'll have your liquidity providers who could provide liquidity on this. You'll have your um, uh, actual customers who will be using it. 
And then you'll have ODL customers. So the one key component here is that ODL provides a consistent flow of market takers. They're consistently sourcing XRP regardless of the price. If it went down 10% one day or up 10% one day, the ODL customer doesn't care. They just need the XRP to source liquidity. So this is why the volatility doesn't matter. And if you've read their patent from, I think it was in April or May it came out, they say right in the patent at each exchange, they have a slippage wallet that, that tops up and covers any slippage. And now they're able to do that because they have the seniorage of basically the escrow release. So they could just have a wallet at each at exchange to just cover any slippage. So that guaranteed FX exchange rate gets covered if there is slippage. And I think they would do that in the liquidity hub as well, which is just an expansion upon the ODL, not just for cross-border payments. Now it's tapping into the whole crypto market. And the other component they could add in here is Ripple line of credit. So the one problem the whole industry has is lending, is line of credit. Lending without collateral. Ripple is able to do that without any cost out of their pocket or any risk. So that's a pretty powerful component here especially when it comes to XRP. So I know a lot of people are gonna ask, well, how does this affect XRP? Why is this important for XRP? They have a bunch of other digital assets on there. XRP is just one. You have to keep in mind, XRP is at the center of ODL. And now we tie in the XRP ledger. So the XRP ledger has a DEX. And I see that as being literally at the center of the whole liquidity hub. So you have all these exchanges on the outside, they trade off-chain. The XRP Ledger's DEX is on-chain. So everything could be settled eventually on-chain or memorialized on a blockchain like PolySign. So how does this tie into the side chains? We don't fully know yet, but I think we'll have a clearer picture once we see some of them spin up. Yeah, and basically since side chains are, you know, essentially L1s that have a way to connect to the XRP Ledger, uh, kind of a pre-designed way, you, this this kind of liquidity hub, this L2, like layer two aggregator could go above some of the side chains if there's enough activity on them to warrant that. Uh, you know, we'll have an EVM side chain in the future and maybe some meaningful economic activity starts emerging from there, whether it's around NFTs or DeFi, gaming, whatever that may be, you know, whatever is the big selling point for that in the future, we'll have to see. But it certainly could, you know, adapt to include those kind of side chain networks as well yeah and tokenization is going to be a big part yeah. of the future that comes up so ripple keeps hammering this whole tokenization narrative right tokenization nfts this is what's coming in the future and you know we know nfts are going to be more than just digital art and that's something we see right now but it's going to be letters of credit bonds other types of assets and financial products that are new that interact with DeFi. And Ashish Burley even said, you know, the future is DeFi even for Ripple. Like when Ashish Burley was on Tony from Thinking Crypto's channel, and Tony did a great interview, but when he asked, when he asked him and said, oh, does Ripple look like they're gonna wanna have an ETF with XRP? Ashish Burley was like, um, no, we're not really looking to go in that direction. We're looking to bring things on chain, which means more decentralized finance instead of bringing things onto the traditional market rails, they wanna bring things onto the new rails. So I would think even in the future when Ripple IPOs, I wouldn't be surprised if they tried to do something really forward thinking with their IPO. Not saying it's gonna be necessarily a full blown security token offering, but I would think they're gonna do something along the lines of tokenizing their stock. I don't know if that plays in with Sologenic and what they're doing or with PolySign and what they're doing with tokenization of real estate and other assets, but I do see them being at the forefront here with the tokenization as well. Since they're creating this whole liquidity hub, it's going to be the foundation for all types of digital assets, not just crypto assets. Absolutely, Mickey. And, you know, to give a comparison here, we did a video covering a project called Credo a few months ago, probably back in September at this point. Yep. And essentially, they're doing a lot of the stuff that Ripple is doing, but that's a permissionless network to start. So it seems like the game plan for Ripple, which we know like they've been doing with RippleNet uh, in the beginning, is to kind of, you know, tend to the institutions, you know, the market makers, centralized exchanges, um, 
financial institutions, banks, all that stuff first, and then eventually lower the barriers and open that up into a permissionless setting. And, you know, something like Credo, they're starting open source permissionless and trying to bring the institutions to that. So it's kind of two different lines of thinking to me, but they're both trying to accomplish very similar things. So, you know, if you want to kind of learn more about what could possibly be going on, uh, you know, they could even build, you know, DeFi within their permission layer two and stuff like that to allow these, you know, all the customers tapped in to the liquidity hub to do some more like, you know, advanced transactions between one another. So I think it's really interesting. And I like that, especially Burla, you know, is open to the fact that, you know, in the future, like open source permissionless is the way to go. It's just where they're not there yet, basically. Yeah, and we could see some of these side chains have DeFi products built on them. Even if they're mm -hmm. institutional grade DeFi, there's going to be this convergence between even Ripple's liquidity hub and then the permissionless, you know, open source market. There's not going to be these segregated walls forever. And, you know, when David Schwartz said that, he said that strictly about CBDCs. So Ripple with their liquidity hub, I think, is going to tap into also the retail market. Now, they might not do it directly, but there'll be other providers like your Celsius's, your Nexos, your BlockFi's, or some other company, or even financial institutions that like your Robinhood, PayPal's, that offer directly to retail. And then they use the liquidity hub on the back end. So those are definitely possible. We're going to see more of these wallet providers spin up in the future because they're not going to be able to build something like a liquidity hub, like a PayPal can't build a, or an Apple or a Google can't just build a wallet and tap into full liquidity for everything. And even Coinbase themselves, they're kind of siloed off chain and they're just you're stuck on there now. So a lot of these corporates are going to be looking for places to go too. So I think corporates are another avenue that this liquidity hub is going to attract. And now coming back to XRP, how does this affect XRP? It puts XRP front and center in the middle. So I think once we get clarity from the courts in January, and I truly believe we're going to get clarity from the courts, it's not coming from a settlement, it's not coming from Congress anytime soon, it's going to come from the courts in January or February, and likely there'll be a summary judgment on XRP. And once that happens and we get clarity, the rest of the case could go on. You know, Brad and Chris's charges, the whole investment contracts could go on for months. But if we get clarity on XRP, that allows this whole ODL and Liquidity Hub to fully spin up. And now if we have that clarity there, that brings in all the American institutions. It brings in all the exchanges in the U.S., all to tie into this. So Ripple was thinking bigger years ago than just a single exchange. It's a distributed exchange of many exchanges tied together which cool. I think is just like a grand vision that's been planned for years now. And Polyson, I do believe, fits in. Just don't know exactly how yet. Yeah, I feel. I mean, I got to feel like it's part of this. It's like a combined tech stack or they're, you know, tapping into what PolySign is doing. And, and on that, yeah, it's like we've kind of been drip fed how things work for a long time or, you know, people finding patents and all that. And I feel like the liquidity hub, as well as all the information PolySign has been releasing this year has really like started giving us a full vision of what they're trying to accomplish. You know, yeah, and even future. SBI, if you look at SBI's wallet, it's called SBI Institutional Multi-Party Computation Wallet that is specifically designed for custody. So it allows them to offer like wallet as a service so they could have wallets that have permissions on them, but they, their customers then say hedge funds or any other type of wealth management can have their own access to a bunch of different blockchains, but have permissions on top from SBI. So an insurance and security in that way. So it gives the best of both worlds. And I think we're going to see that in the wallet structure moving forward, you know, moving away from this cold storage, hardware wallet, archaic mindset, and more to these MPC type wallets well, you'll be able to connect to multiple different blockchains and multiple different exchanges and DeFi apps from just one wallet source in like a layer two. Yeah, it'll, I feel like it'll be, you know, we'll kind of know that we're at that point when you could, instead of like going inside of a centralized exchange, like it feels like now, it'll just kind of be like a shop front that, you know, you kind of pick from, but all of your assets are not living on that exchange anymore. Uh, I've seen some like really interesting stuff around, you know, providing ways for decentralized custody 
while tapping into these centralized exchanges for retail. So mm -hmm. I think all this stuff's really exciting. And it's just, you know, the steps to get crypto where it needs to be to, you know, be able to facilitate services and, you know, for everybody, essentially, you know, from institutions all the way down to your retail. Yeah, and I think one other component that's going to be necessary there is the self-sovereign digital identities and privacy. So those two could come together. And that's something in the past that was, you know, never conceivable that you could actually have privacy, like zero knowledge proofs, transparency with privacy. And the standards already exist for from the W3C for verifiable credentials, for self-sovereign identity. These already exist. So they're not far-fetched. They're ready to go. So the travel rule is coming with Fat F, with them wanting to know where the assets came from, who they came from, and that's easily fixable with digital identities. And those are gonna be coming and they can be attached to self-custody wallets and still maintain your privacy. Because right now, all your accounts with every one of these exchanges, they're custodying all your data. So if you could have access to only your data and share what you want, and it can be verified in a zero knowledge proof way, something like what Panther Protocol is doing, I think it's really cool for institutions and for retail moving forward. Yeah, absolutely. And Panther Protocol is something that'll fit into, you know, the CBDC game in the future as, you know, we could potentially see CBDCs get issued onto per permissionless networks. And with that, you know, people are probably going to want to be able to use some privacy functions in that regard. So we'll have to see how that goes. But there's a lot of, you know, a lot of different projects, including stuff from Ripple and, you know, other corporations out there, as well as some, you know, decentralized and permissionless projects working on all this stuff right now. So I, you know, I don't think it's much longer before we're at a place where, you know, just about everything you want to be able to do is ready to go. Yeah, it's exciting. I mean, the adoption curve right now is moving at warp speed. We're moving into DeFi 2.0. We got all the exchanges getting pulled together with liquidity hubs like this. And this is what we need for institutional money to truly come in. But the key here is things are going to come on chain, like that whole concept of ETFs and cryptos being traded on stock markets. I don't really see as like the ultimate goal of where we're going. We want derivatives to come on chain. We want ETFs and things to come on chain. That's why when Ashish Birla answered Tony in that question, he's like, we don't want an ETF for XRP. That does nothing for us. We want to bring this stuff on chain where we could create new types of financial products and new types of institutional DeFi 2.0 stuff that's coming out with tokenization. Because once you use tokenized assets as collateral, it blows the whole game wide open. Sure. And that's where we're going. So these CBDCs that they're designing now are going to have to adapt to this innovative world that's being created right now, moving at warp speed. So you could say bear cycle, bull cycle, all that cycle, you can look at your charts all day but the adoption curve is moving at a rapid pace forward. And it's not stopping because of Gensler, it's not stopping because of the infrastructure bill, it's just pushing on forward and it's going to continue in that way. And we have to keep our eyes open to what is being developed here. So we have to watch it like what Ripple's building on the institutional front, but even them, like what Patty said, as she's probably said, we wanna slowly move into a permissionless, open source, decentralized world. So that's good to hear that they're moving in that world. Absolutely. Well, that's all I got. You know, all I have to say mm -hmm. at this point, Mickey, any final thoughts that you want to get no. across? No, I just want everyone to know that XRP is at the front and center of what they're building with this liquidity hub. Even though they're adding in other assets, I do see a pivot of Ripple to crypto first. And this is a good pivot. And I think, yes, they're still going to do cross-border payments, but I think they're going to open up to the crypto markets now. And I think that's what's needed. Once we get clarity here, you can see an explosion in XRP's price. I think 10 to 13. Ah, uh, you cut out there, Mickey. <laughs> it's very <laughs> conservative in my opinion. Yeah, there you go. Cool. Yeah. So, I mean, I kind of think it's just a rising tide lifts all boats. So, you know, the more that crypto can be accessible yeah. and if Ripple helps that, it's going to ultimately come back for XRP. All right. Well, I lost Mickey there. <laughs> so hope you guys enjoyed this one. This is the DeFi standard. I'm Patty XRP and we're out.